أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذ قيل لهم اسكنوا هذه القرية وكلوا منها حيث شئتم وقولوا حطة وادخلوا الباب سجدا نغفر لكم خطيئاتكم سنزيد المحسنين فبدل الذين ظلموا منهم قولا غير الذي قيل لهم فأرسلنا عليهم رجزا من السماء بما كانوا يظلمون واسألهم عن القرية التي كانت حاضرة البحر إذ يعدون في السبت إذ تأتيهم فيتانهم يوم سبتهم شرعا ويوم لا يسبتون لا تأتيهم كذلك نبلوهم بما كانوا يفسقون وإذ قالت أمة منهم لم تعيبون قوما الله مهدكهم أو معذبهم عذابا شديدا قالوا معذرة إلى ربكم ولعلهم يتقون رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا إن شاء الله in this brief reminder I'd like to add a couple of things uh, very little can be added to what was already said and much of what I was planning to say has already been uh, has already been robbed by Abdul Nasir as usual so I'm going to keep this speech short. I know every speaker says I'm going to make it short when they're going to make it extra long, but I think I actually mean it this time. I think. Well, only time will tell. Have hope. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to share with you guys is just some uh, uh, an, a recommendation after this talk is done. When you get time on your own, uh, there's something I want you to guys, guys to watch on YouTube. I believe it's halal. Um, it's, it's a professor named uh, Professor Hisham Al-Awadi. Professor Hisham Al-Awadi has about an hour-long lecture on not losing hope. And I think it's one of the best presentations of the topic I've ever heard personally. Uh, I'll share some of the things from that with you and I've changed some things from his talk. But I think it's worth listening to and worth taking notes on also. It's just personally very beneficial to Muslims, I think. And uh, just even for your family to hear. Uh, but I, I advise you guys to hear it yourself, parents especially, just hear it yourself, inshallah ta'ala, and try to discuss some of those things on your own with your kids instead of sticking them in front of a TV screen or a computer screen and having them watch a video because they won't. Uh, so I want to share a couple of things with you in terms of the, some things that the, the students of the Prophet وسلم, the best students of the Prophet, the companions some things they just understood about sins. Some things that they were very clear about that we nowadays are not very clear about and I want to just reiterate them just so we can refresh ourselves and our attitudes in terms of sin. The first thing is when you and I sin, we're disappointed with ourselves. That's a matter of fact. I mean, if you have any ounce of decency left in you, when you do something wrong, at the end of the day, you look back and you say, how could I do that? that, that you're, you've lost hope in yourself in some respect. And that's what disappointment by definition is. You've lost hope in yourself. And you ask yourself, how could I have done such a thing? That's natural, it's normal. It's not something bad to be disappointed in yourself. It's not something bad to be sad about your sin. It's actually a gift from Allah Azza wa Jalla. It means you still have a conscience. But that disappointment was never confused. They never confused it and allowed that disappointment that they've lost hope in themselves. They're not confident in themselves anymore. They didn't let that become or translate into Allah has lost hope in me. Just because I don't have hope in myself does not mean Allah does not have hope in me, or Allah does not, does not expect more from me, or Allah Himself is disappointed in me. They didn't extend it to that. Just even if you've given up on yourself, the Muslim knew, they understood certain qualities of Allah that are permanent. You know, our feelings and our temperaments, they go up and down. You have good days and you have bad days, like Abdul Nasser said. You have good and bad days. But Allah, but Allah Azza wa Jalla's mercy and His, His power to forgive is always there. So you don't, you don't confuse your mood and your state of being and your level of sadness with Allah's constant open door policy. Then the second thing, they understood that how no, no matter how big their sin is, and they should feel terrible even about smaller sins, and they were. They were sensitive to the smallest infractions, the smallest sins. But regardless, no matter how big their sin gets, they knew Allah's mercy is still bigger. So they would never think, I've done so much bad now that I'm beyond the point of return, that there's no hope left for me, I'm way past hope. You know, one time I gave, you know, I was talking to a bunch of youth about forgiveness. Just a small reminder about just make regular istighfar and ask Allah to forgive you, etc. And one brother came up to me afterwards and said, can I talk to you in private? And I said, sure. So we go in the corner and he says, bro, look, I've done a lot of messed up stuff. I mean, I'll ask for forgiveness because you're saying, but I'm pretty sure God's not going to forgive what I did. 
And I was like, well, I'm pretty sure he will. He goes, no, bro, you don't know what I did, bro. I'm bad. I was like, I know you're bad. You're pretty bad. I can appreciate that. But know that even, you, you don't have to tell me how bad you are, and you don't have to list to me the crimes you've committed, so I go, oh snap, you're right. You ain't going, you're going to hell. <laughs> you don't have to do that to me. But know that Allah Azza wa knows your sins, and has forgiven people that have transgressed far more than you in the past. Not only that, people that Allah knew, Allah always knows what's going to happen in the future, yes? So Allah knew Fir'aun will die a kafir, yes? Allah already knew Fir'aun is going to kill babies. He's going to, can you imagine that? I mean, just picture that idea. He's going to kill babies. How evil does a person have to be? Not one by the thousands every other year. Not to mention the innocent people. This is his humanitarian crimes that even an atheist would say Fir'aun should die. Even a human rights activist would say Fir'aun should die. He should suffer a thousand deaths. This is above and beyond what he says about himself, declaring himself God. Allah already knows what kind of evil person this is. It's hard to match that kind of evil. It's hard. We come pretty close in the Muslim world sometimes, but it's hard. You know, may Allah help the Muslims in the Arab Spring. You know, but regardless, I want to make a point. You know, when Allah Azza wa Jal sent Musa alayhi salam to talk to Fir'aun, he says, "La'allahu yazakka." Maybe he'll get purified by benefiting from the reminder. Allah puts hope in Musa alayhi salam when talking to Fir'aun, even though Allah already knows where he's going to end up. He already knows. But you're not allowed to give up hope on people. And they themselves, even as terrible as he is, Allah knows he still has the potential. He is also not at the point of no return. He can still make the choice. He can still make the choice. SubhanAllah. Not even giving up on Fir'aun, who's left? Who's left? I met a mother not too long ago. She came to a Muslim mother, very religious, very devout mother. And she has two sons, one of them very religious, the other one, let's just not describe it, right? So she comes to me at the end of a seminar on Surat Ar-Rahman, <laughs> of all things. And she says, brother, I can't make dua for my other son, I can't do it. I've taken him out of my heart. He's no longer my son. He parties, he goes to clubs, he has a girlfriend or two, and He's on drugs and he doesn't listen to me as he pray, he hasn't prayed in two or three years. My other son is a hafiz of Quran and he's doing this and that. I don't have any hope in that other son. I've taken it out of my heart. And I, first thing, you know what I told her? MashaAllah, no. I said, how dare you, lady? Allah made her, you, Allah made him your son. Allah created that connection. You are not in any position to cut a connection that Allah Himself made. The only day on which connections are cut is the day of judgment. Until then, you are bonded to your son. And until the command of Allah comes, you cannot cut yourself off. And she says, but what about this? Ibrahim, you know, Nuh alayhi salam, he was trying to save his son and Allah told him, no, it's like Allah told you? <laughs> You're gonna cite that revelation came to Nuh alayhi salam. To cut his relationship from his son, 950 point something years, he's still hoping with his son. And the only time he stops is when Allah tells him to stop. So you're gonna, your six months of frustration compared to 950 years of Nuh alayhi salam? What is wrong with you? You can't do that. You can't lose hope in people. As was mentioned before. So now I want to share with you this the second thing that your sin is not greater than Allah's mercy. Then, a third interesting thing that the Sahaba understood and sometimes we don't clearly understand. Your sin is not more powerful than you are. Your sin does not have control of you. You're in control. People say, I can't help myself. I can't help myself. I just get angry and yeah, no, then my lights turn off. I don't know what's going on after that. And a few hours later when I'm, you know, my color has changed back from green to back to human again. And I've shrunk in size. Now then I'm, I don't know. I have no recollection of what happened in the past. You know, a bunch of incredible hopes in our community, but their anger. Oh, bro, you know, when I once I get talent player, I can't help myself. You know, I go to college, and you know, what I'm saying it just happens. What can I do? Can't help. It's beyond me. It's I. I it, it's beyond. I don't have any power over myself. I can't help myself. I can't help my finger from clicking. You know, I can't help but respond to the text. 
I can't help but look at that stuff. I can't help myself. Sahaba understood. Yes, we make mistakes. And sometimes our sins get the better of us. Shaitan's waswasa gets the better of you. Your nafs al-ammara gets the better of you. But Allah created you with control over yourself. And only you can give up that control. They understood, yeah, it's like you're guarding a territory. Your heart is like this castle you're guarding. And shaitan is hovering around, trying to make his way in. And then one moment of heedlessness, like a guard who falls asleep and a crook slips right in, you, you drop your guard a little, he slips right in, you make a mistake, but does that mean he's, he's, he's won? If you woken up, you can kill him, kick him out again and lock the doors again. That's what istighfar is, that's what tawbah is, that's what dhikr is. It's reinforcing your defenses. You cannot allow your sin to win. You can't say to yourself, look, it's, it's won, it's already got the best of me, I'm beyond hope. Just like we don't say the sin, or my sin cannot be greater than Allah's mercy, my sin is not greater than myself. Allah created us much more noble than that. Allah says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ Human beings who are created in the best possible fashion. Human beings who are honored. An honored human being cannot be giving up into his sin. He can't be caving in. So we understand our sins in addition, just as an addition to that same point, we understand our sins as an enemy. An enemy that disguises itself as a friend, cons us, and we do something wrong, just like shaitan itself is an enemy. So we recognize that enemy the moment we wake up and we distance ourselves. We cut ourselves off. And maybe we'll fall into that sin again just because we're human. But that does not mean we'll get used to it. And we're going to be fine with the fact that we'll just mentally adjust ourselves and say, I know I'll be doing this in two weeks anyway, so it's alright. It's not going to be like that. You'll never mentally accept defeat from your sin. It will never happen. This, this is the attitude of our companions. Then they understood another another thing, and this is a very a very important concept when when dealing with sin and losing hope. People lose hope when they think they've got they've messed up way too much, you know, and they can't turn back to Allah anymore. The idea is where are you going to turn back to? Sahaba understood. No matter how much, even if we think we've disappointed Allah, where are you going to go? I've got nowhere to go. There's no place I can hide. There's no place Allah doesn't see me. You know, when you disappoint your mother, your boss, your teacher, you can avoid eye contact. You can just go into your room and close the door. You, maybe you, you disappointed a friend, you said something mean to them, you're embarrassed to talk to them again, you don't call them. You don't respond to their text, you're kind of, it's awkward. Because you don't want to deal with that, so you just avoid contact. The problem is Allah is constantly in contact, whether you realize it or not. We're closer to them than, than the jugular vein right here. This rope that connects life, Allah is closer than that. How are you going to distance yourself from Allah will not distance himself. He's already there. He's already there. We're the ones that pretend he's not there. And you know how offensive it is when someone's there and you pretend they're not there? I'm sure you do that all the time, old friend. Two of you are talking, a third one walks in, you pretend they're not there, you keep talking among yourselves, and you, you pick another language to talk in so they don't, really don't know what you're talking about, right? It's offensive to Allah that you pretend he's not there. So the next point, when they did sin, they realized Allah is right there. They're caught on camera. They realized immediately they're caught on camera. So you know what they did? Immediately, sorry Allah. Astaghfirullah al It was a slip. They don't just say Astaghfirullah. They're talking not about Allah. They're not just saying something. They're talking to Allah. They're talking to Allah. You ever seen a kid whose mom says, don't touch the fridge? And looks around? And his hand goes towards the fridge? And then he hears, <coughs> and he turns on his mom standing right behind him. What does he do? He gives mom a hug. Sorry, mom. Sorry. Not going to do it again, I promise. <laughs> you know. You recognize the presence of the one you've disappointed. You turn to him immediately. There's no, there's no lapse in between. You don't waste any time. This is the next point. They, they understood there's no time. They understood, I can't wait to come back to Allah and mend this relationship. I have to do this immediately. There's a shortage of time, there's a sense of urgency. Then, the last one, the last bit that I want to share with you. And this is actually one of the most important. A lot of times we meet people that make us lose hope. They say things to us that disappoint us or make us feel like, yeah, you're right, I am scum. They'll tell you how haram you and your actions are, how evil you've become, etc., etc. Don't confuse the disappointment people have with you with the disappointment Allah might have with you. They're not the same thing. 
They're not the same thing. Your parents' disappointment with you, your husband's disappointment with you, your wife's disappointment with you, your friend's disappointment with you, your imam's disappointment with you, is not the same as Allah being disappointed with you. It's not the same. People can put you down, and they will. But Allah Azza wa Jal will never abandon, so long as you don't. I wanted to, I don't like to give a talk without turning back to Allah's book in one way or another. So I wanted to share this one of, one of my favorite passages with you that deals with the last discussion that Shaykh Abdul Nasir had with you guys, which was about not giving up on people, and he gave us several instances from the instances of the companions' lives. I want to turn to a nation that we think is just damned, Bani Israel. Every time Muslims would think, the worst thing you could talk, call them, hey man, this guy's like Bani Israel, totally. Right, that means like they're totally cursed, or you know, we hate them, and they're going to hell. That's one example of people that are just completely damned, there's no hope in them. So I picked a passage that has to do with Bani Israel, so we're clear about some things. So we understand how Allah talks about them. وَإِذْ قِيلَ لَهُمْ أُسْكُنُوا هَذِهِ الْقَرِيَةِ When we said to them, settle down in this town. This was said after they had crossed the water. After they had already disobeyed Musa alayhi salam and questioned his authority and had undermined him on several occasions. Even if you undermine a messenger once, it's enough for you to be done. But they were given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. At the end of it all, Allah says, I'm even giving you a city and a house. Go ahead. What, so, Al-Qariya, كُلُوا مِنْهَا وَكُلُوا مِنْهَا حَيْثُ شَيْتُمْ And eat from it whatever you want. وَقُولُوا حِطَّةً There's one condition. As you go in, you should be saying حِطَّةً which means forgiveness. As you walk into the city as conquerors, you should enter into the city in a state of sajda. وَقُلُوا الْبَابَ سُجَّدًا Enter into the city in a state of sajda. Some of you might be confused. How do you enter the gates of a city in the state of sajda? Right, because sajda is on the ground. Now how are you going to enter? It's going to hurt your forehead a little. If you try to do that. Well, understand, those of you that play like games like Assassin's Creed or one of those like 16th century, 14th century video games, they, 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 they draw a map of these ancient cities for you with gigantic gates. Right, they, they have a colossal gate in you. This, this is what old, old cities were like. They were gated all around and they had this one massive gate you go through. And the conquerors are riding into that gate, through that gate on their horses. And their heads are on the necks of these horses in sajda. A conqueror walks in like this. You know, because he's dominated the people, the people's heads are down. And Allah says, your conquerors? No, no, no. You put your heads down to Allah when you conquer the city. And as you're put, putting your head in sajda, while you're doing so, what should you say? Hitfa, you should be asking forgiveness. 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 As, as you're going in. In a state of sajda, you're asking for forgiveness. Allah says, all your past crimes are forgiven. Just do this. Just do what? Ask for forgiveness. Have they done small crimes or big crimes in the past? Huge crimes. Not just in the absence of a prophet, in the presence of a prophet they've done huge crimes. What are some of those huge crimes? Let's see. Oh yeah, worshipping someone other, other than Allah. A, a calf. You know the story. Crimes like murder. Crimes like dis, you know, disregarding gifts of Allah, saying this ain't enough, where is the rest of the menu? What's, what's for dinner? Manna and salwa. What's for lunch? Salwa and manna. What else we got? Can you go ask Allah, please, some additional order, please? This is how you talk to Allah. And Allah says, all forgiven if you just do what? Ask genuinely for forgiveness. And they played with that. Has Allah forgiven previous sins before? To them? He's let so many things go. We've then we pardon you, then we pardon you, then we pardon you. But when they played around with forgiveness, Allah says, لَكُمْ خَطِيْآتِكُمْ You just ask for forgiveness, we will cover your extended list of sins. وَسَنَزِيدُ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And we will excel, increase those who have ihsan. Now you guys know, there's Islam and then what? Iman and then what? Ihsan. Allah is talking to people that have a long list of sins and He's saying, just if you ask for forgiveness, there is no end to how awesome you can become. You can even become from the muhsineen. You never know what someone can achieve, even if their track record is bad. Allah cleans the state, oh, slate, only because they ask for forgiveness. But what did they do? They replaced the word that was given to them. The word was, the instruction was forgiveness. They replaced forgiveness with mockery. They made a mockery out of forgiveness. That's one thing Allah won't forgive. Allah gave you one thing that can get rid of all your crimes and you make fun of that one thing which is what? Asking for forgiveness. 
What do we learn from that? And Allah sent them a punishment from the sky immediately. He didn't even wait for judgment day. He didn't even, for the rest of Bani Israel, Allah told them, إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّنٍ Until a given time. But for this group that played around with Allah's offering of forgiveness, the ones that played with that, Allah sent them the punishment immediately because of the corruption that they used to be engaged in. What do we learn from that? Don't make fun of the power of forgiveness. Don't make light of forgiveness. Take it seriously that you're going to ask Allah for forgiveness. Don't say, ah, astaghfirullah. <laughs> no. No, it's not a light matter. It's a serious matter. It means you've come back to Allah. Because that's something Allah will not procrastinate punishing you for. This is what will connect you directly to Allah Azza wa Jalla. So don't make light of it. Don't be like them. Now, now let's turn to hope in, in other people. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Was alhum? Ask them about the nation, عن القرية التي كانت حاضرة البحر that used to be right at the very edge of the ocean. In other words, they were they were a beach town. There was a group among Bani Israel that were a beach community. And they, obviously, when they're, you're a beach community, what's your primary economy? Fishing. That's your primary means of sustenance." If يَعْدُونَ فِي السَّبْتِ When they used to violate the Sabbath, the Saturday. You know how they used to violate the Sabbath, right? You're not supposed to do any business on Sabbath. You're supposed to just worship Allah. That was the instruction of Bani Israel. Allah says they violated the Sabbath. Now Allah explains why they did that. If تَأْتِيهِمْ حِتَانُهُمْ يَوْمَ سَبْتٍ يَوْمَ سَبْتِهِمْ شُرَّعًا When their fish would come to them on the day of Sabbath, jumping out of the water. And like, make eye contact with them. So, I'm right, what you going to do? <laughs> you know? And then Allah says, as a test, وَيَوْمَ لَا يَسْبِتُونَ لَا تَأْتِيهِمْ On the days that there were no Saturdays on them, no fish would show up. So they look at the fish like, I'll get you tomorrow, Sunday. Game day, <laughs> you know. They show up Sunday, no fish. The whole week, no fish. Saturday, they jump out of the water again, they're like, oh. So they have to come up with some way of capturing those fish and not violating the law of Allah. So they played with Allah's law. They made it, because you know high tide and low tide, the water comes in. So they made a ditch, the water would come in, and when it recedes, some water gets stuck with the fish in it, they got them. Right? It's like, ah, oh, but we didn't do anything on Saturday. Right? Technicality. Getting off on the technicality from court. Not in Allah's court. You can't argue technicality. People say, you shouldn't talk to a non-mahram. I'm not talking, I'm just pressing my fingers on the string. That's not, that's, that's not talking. And you shouldn't talk in solitude. I'm not in solitude, I'm on train station. I'm at the airport. I'm at school, people all around me. I'm not in solitude. Technicalities, try them with Allah. See how that works out for you. But I wanted, the, the real subject, the, the reason I wanted to share this with you guys, was Salat Ummatul Minhi. You know, there was a group among them that tried to warn them not to play with Allah's law. Did these guys know that that's Allah's law? The ones that were playing with Allah's law, did they know that that's Allah's law? Yes. So you know there's two kinds of sinners. There's a sinner that doesn't know any better. They don't know any better. Then there's sinners that know what they're doing is wrong and they do it anyway. Now when they know that they're doing something wrong and they do it anyway, you say, man, there's no point telling him, why not? He already knows. It's not like me telling him is going to change anything, because whatever I was going to say, he already knows. But a group among them would go regularly and try to give them advice and say, please don't do this. It's not good for you. It's not good for us. It's not becoming of Muslims to play with Allah's law. Ask for forgiveness. There's still hope for you. Just make tawbah. They would try to keep going back. There was another group among the Muslims who were not playing with the law of Allah, who said, these people are munafiq. There's no reason, there's no reason, talk, no, no justification talking to them. Don't waste your time talking to them. The next ayah is about a disagreement between two groups of Muslims. Both of them are not playing with Allah's law. One is saying there's no hope in these sinners, and the other is saying, no, we should still go talk to them. Allah says, if qalat ummatun minhum, a group of among them said, Lima ta'ibuna qawman, Allahu muhlikuhum. Why are you giving advice to a nation that Allah has already decided to destroy? Allah is going to destroy them, guaranteed. Muhlikuhum, the ism is used. Why? Because in their mind, these guys are guaranteed going to be destroyed. أَوْ مُعَذِّبُهُمْ عَذَابًا شَدِيدًا Or he's going to torture them with an intense kind of torture. Why are you even going near them? Don't get caught in the blast fire. Just stay away from them. Because Allah's punishment is any second now. Just don't worry about it. Leave them alone. Don't bother with these people. We still have that today. Man, those guys are liberal. How much time? Five minutes? Wow. Five minutes, that's a long time. Okay, I'll finish before then. 
you won't have to give me the minus three like Abdul Nasser. <laughs> okay. So, what was I saying after that? Thanks, Abdul Nasser. Huh? Why? Why are you even bothering giving them advice? What's the point? Do we find that today? Those Muslims are liberal. They're partiers. They don't even come to the masjid. There's no point talking to them. Entire entire lectures dedicated to how some Muslims are and how they're headed straight for the hell and they're the munafiqun and this and that. Well, don't bother talking to them. Allah has already decided to take care of them. Those progressives and those liberals and those you know those those secularists and those modernized Muslims and you know those guys. Don't bother with them. I met a Muslim like a couple of months ago at the Irving Masjid. Came to the Masjid after 12 years for the first time. First time. No Jum'ah, no Eid, nothing. 12 years for the first time. He owned like 8 bars. All across Dallas. And just one, Ramadan, one night in Ramadan, something clicked in his heart that this is wrong. So he started, he, he had actually, he told me he had never even read the Quran in translation ever. So he just started reading the Quran in translation. And he decided overnight, just that Ramadan, know what was of shaitan, right? He's gonna pull out of the business. He pulled out of all the business. His brother kicked him out of the house. His friends don't want to invite him anymore because they've been in the beer business, the, the bar business for a long time. So even when he goes to his brother's house, all Muslims by the way, they're all Muslims. Okay? They go to his brother's house, they, they have to drink together. That's like their sign of brotherhood. So he's, when he says, I'm not gonna drink, they're offended, they kick him out. So he's completely isolated and he comes to Allah's house. It's cut off. Those are the kind of people we'd say, if we met that guy two months ago, we said, there's no way, this guy in the masjid, come on. Are you kidding me? There's no way. We wouldn't expect anything from them. And you know part of that, the more religious some of our community gets, at least the more they look like they're religious, the more judgmental they become. They start looking at others as less. They look, they look at your face before they, you know, and judge your heart from it. There's a hijab on this one, there's no beard on that one, there's... I know what they're about already. I know the state of their iman already. And I know what they have no hope. They have no potential. Easy, easy to pass judgment on people. Right? This is, this is an absurdity. The ahkam of Allah are one thing. Judging people is something entirely different. We're not allowed to. That doesn't take away the ahkam of Allah. It doesn't take away the, the rules of God. The expectations of Allah. But on the other hand, it doesn't give us license to judge. It just doesn't. It simply doesn't. So what does this other group say? This is what I want to end with. One group said, why bother? Right? The other group says, ma'ziratan ila rabbikum. It will be an excuse that we will present to our master, to your master. In other words, Muslims advising other Muslims and not losing hope in them. And ta'ibuna wa'ad means to give an advice that goes inside the heart. Not yazdajiruna, tazdajiruna. Why are you scolding them? Why are you, you know, yelling at them? Tusayyihuna alayhim. No, no, no. Ta'ibuna. Softly counseling them. Giving them words that will actually go inside the heart. That's what wa'ad is. Right? They say we're doing this because if we do this, at least we will have an excuse in front of Allah. Not they, we. Ma'adiratan goes back to them. In other words, we have to care for other believers even if they're falling in sin because Allah will ask us, what did you do about your fellow believer? What did you do about your fellow Muslim who was fallen off? You just gave up on him? You just let them go? Is that what you did? They say, no, we're going to continue to advise them at least in front of Allah. We can't change people's hearts, but at least we'll have an excuse for in front of Allah. Ya Allah, we sincerely tried. You have cousins, uncle, family member, extended family that you don't see except on Eid. And they don't look like you and they don't got no beard and they don't even know the address of the masjid. And you see them every once in a while. And they're very different from you. They're raising their children very differently from how you're raising your children. They're very different from you in every way. A lot of things are easily halal on them that are not halal for you. You know you can't do them, but they do them anyway. And you've decided to cut yourself off from them completely. Because you don't want to get corrupted. It's the other way around. You're supposed to be constantly finding opportunities to give them good advice. You're supposed to remain connected. Allah made you a family for a reason. Allah put you in the same neighborhood for a reason. Allah brought you to the same community for a reason. Allah put you in the same company to work as co-workers for a reason. So you could have opportunity to share advice with each other. Ma'adilatan ila rabbikum. And then they add finally, What I want to conclude with. Hopefully, maybe. 
so that they will have taqwa also. What do these people express? Just because they're doing playing with the Yom, yom Asap right now, knowingly, not unknowingly, knowingly, they're doing that, that does not mean they don't have a heart anymore. It might still mean after they're done playing with the day of Sabbath and they got those fish, while they're eating it or after they're done eating it, something goes in their heart and says, I shouldn't have done that. I hope we get fish this time, so next Saturday I don't have to do it. Something might, some conscience might still be in there. And maybe if I just go and give them a little bit of advice, it might just work. It might just work. Just that little bit might just work. You know? This is, we don't understand the power. Allah can put so much power in sincere advice. If you genuinely do it for the sake of Allah, and because you care about somebody else, genuinely, if you give advice for that reason, our words are powerless, but Allah puts power in them. Allah puts His kun fayakun in them, He puts His barakah in them. You will never know how much barakah Allah will put inside your words, if they come sincerely. I can tell you personally, they were friends of mine, but back when I was in college, and I didn't use to make salat or anything. That's the least of my problems back in college. And this one guy just one time found a good opportunity to say, Hey bro, why don't you pray with us? He said it so nicely. Why don't you pray with us? And I started praying. I didn't miss a prayer since. Just because of that guy. Allah put something in his word. He didn't give me a long lecture. He didn't show me how salat is called, and the one who abandons salat will burn in hell, and he's going to have these punishments in the grave, and he will be considered a kafir by certain fuqaha. And he didn't give me a list of the deed. He said, hey bro, come on, let's pray. Okay. Let's go. Some of you, one of your friends, hey bro, okay, let's, let's not go to that party, it's no good for us. Alright bro, okay, you're right. Hey bro, let's calm down, let's not fight. Okay. You know, your sisters are talking, somebody's, you know, talking trash about somebody, let's just leave them alone. Okay. A little bit of advice. Just a small, soft word. And it can save somebody so much trouble. So much trouble. We can't give up hope on people. And it will, the proof of that will be, how ready are you to be soft and considerate when giving sincere advice? If you're no longer maintaining connection, and by the way, don't just call people to give them advice. That's stupid. Okay? Don't call people to give them advice. Call people to be their friend. Have a relationship with people. Be genuine friends. Help them out in the hour of need. And then, they are, their heart is open to you for advice. Otherwise, all they see is someone who's self-righteous, who thinks they're going to tell me how to live my life, they think they're so much better than me. Don't do that to people. That's self, that is self-righteous. Be genuine friends to people before you start giving advice, before you start telling them how to live their lives, and how to raise their kids, and how to spend their time. Don't do that. It'll fire, it'll backfire. And you'll say, oh, I, I did my job. Our job is but to warn. Bashiran wa nadiran. In your case, nadiran wa nadiran. Right? <laughs> And this, I did my job, now that now it's between them and Allah. No, it's not, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. We just have to find the best opportunity we can. May Allah Azza wa Jal open up our hearts and may not, never allow us to lose hope in Allah Azza wa Jal. And may Allah make us of those who become a source of hope for others. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us of those who never lose hope in our family, in our children, in our parents, in our elders, in our community, in our masajid, in our institutions in the world. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us a people of hope and may Allah Azza wa Jal give us barakah through our genuine expectations of Him. And I in the Allah Abdi Bi Allah says, I am as my slave assumes me to be. We have good expectations of Allah. We expect the best from Allah and you will get the best because that's what Allah promised. May Allah Azza wa Jal give all of us the best in this life and the best in the next life. Barakallahu li wa lakum wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.